The multicultural idea is that you, you maintain ethnic boundaries and you recognize group identities and, and keep those group identities rather than focusing on, on people's uh, individual traits and, and treating people as, a, as an individual. Yeah, so notably, Ibram X. Kendi, I think, compared assimilation to, to genocide. And assimilation in this country has, in the last few decades, been given a bad rap. Uh, this notion that assimilation means that people who come here have to give up uh, their, their heritages from wherever they came from. And that is not what the melting pot is about. The, the melting pot is, is really a two-way assimilation. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today is Jens Heike. Jens is a researcher, writer, and competitive cyclist. He studied economics and Near East studies at UChicago, the London School of Economics, and Princeton. His book is called Out of the Melting Pot, Into the Fire, Multiculturalism in the World's Past and in America's Future. In this episode, we talk about the origin of the term melting pot, as well as the origin of the concept of multiculturalism. We talk about the goal of cultural assimilation. We talk about how ancient Rome tackled the issue of cultural diversity among its subjects. We discuss the early Islamic empires, modern-day Sri Lanka, Rwanda and Botswana, the Ottoman Empire, the current French colorblind system, Singapore, and much more. This conversation is basically a survey of how all of these different societies have tackled the issue of cultural diversity and what lessons we can draw from their successes and failures. I enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy it too. So without further ado, Jens Heike. And Jens Heike, yeah. thanks so much for coming on my show. Uh, thank you, Coleman. It's, it's really great to be on. Uh, I have, I think, five family members who are big fans of yours, uh, listen to every single podcast. That's so great. It's really a treat to talk with you in person. Oh, well, it's a treat to talk with you too. And the occasion of our speaking is your book, uh, which is called Out of the Melting Pot into the Fire, which is a, a very interesting exploration of multiculturalism and, um, and you know, how societies blend different tribes, different cultures, what methods a society can take in order to maximize the chances that a diverse multicultural society actually works and is peaceful. And I mean, this is obviously a challenge that is right up my alley and some, something I've dealt with on this podcast a lot. It is central to the American experiment in particular. But as you know, in the book, it's not a, con a problem unique to America. It's a problem that different societies, empires, cultures from all over the world and throughout history have addressed to varying degrees of success with different methods. And your book asks the more global and historical question, what approaches have worked and what approaches have failed? So before we get into the specifics, how did you come to be interested in this particular topic? So I, I come from a first generation immigrant family. So the topic's very near and dear to me. My father uh, came over on a boat when he was 18 years old. He literally had just turned 18, uh, sailed right, right by here into New York Harbor with his one suitcase from, yeah. uh, from Germany. So he was 10 years old at the end of World War II. Um, you know, there's lots of people were basically starving there. It was a difficult place to live. Uh, so he came to the United States and, and incredibly, uh, the way he got here, he was actually sponsored uh, by, by a Jewish family. This is a Jewish family that had lost uh, a member, at least one member in the Holocaust, yet they sponsored and brought over, uh, at liter literally adopted my, my father, a German kid, and to me, uh, you know, that speaks to the very essence of what makes America so wonderful that, that he could come to this country and be seen not as a member of the enemy tribe, but as an individual. And that went on uh, in, in his early years here. He joined the army within a year of arriving here. And similar experience there. 
he he had commanding officers who had served in served in Europe. They'd fought Germans, and you would almost expect that they would give him a hard time. They you know make things difficult for him, but they didn't. They treated him very well. In fact, one of them wanted to nominate him for OCS. Uh, so he's treated extremely well. And and once again, it was because of that most American of of, of traits that he was treated as an individual, not as a member of a group. And at that time, you know, 1953, he could have gone anywhere else in the world practically, and people would have seen him as a German, not not just as an, indiv- an individual, and not as an individual who could become a fellow American. And I think we lose sight in this country of how special that is and how different it is from everywhere else, and or practically everywhere else in the world. Um, person, uh, Chinese people have been you know, in Malaysia for 500 years, and they are still considered to be Chinese and, and not Malay. Uh, even in Germany itself, there, there are people of Turkish descent who have come to Germany. They're, they're there for three generations, and people still call them Turk. Uh, they're, they're treated as members of groups. So that was kind of my background, and I, I grew up valuing that ideal very much. And as I saw in beginning in the 70s and 80s, uh, we, we sort of started to go back on that, that notion of, of treating people as individuals. That, that ideal was, I felt like, was being abandoned. So that's what really started me thinking about, about the overall topic. Mm. So we'll get into all of that, but let's, let's first start with the basic concepts of your book, which are twofold. The melting pot and multiculturalism. These are opposite strategies towards the phenomenon of diversity, let's say, of different tribes, different groups, different cultures. What is the melting pot? Where does that idea come from? So it has a long tradition in American history. I, I, the first person to mention it was, was Hector de Crevecourt, who's a a French immigrant around the time of the American Revolution. He was probably, yeah, he was pretty much the first person to use the term. And he talked about what a wonderful thing it was that um, people could come together in the United States and forge, um, and forge is the term he used, a new, new race of man. And race back then really meant nationality, not, not skin color. Uh, that was followed up by Ralph Waldo Emerson about 100 years later. He used the same metaphor, talk, talking about a smelting pot where, where people of different nationalities uh, came together. And the, the work that really put the term into common use was a play uh, written in 1908 by a guy by the name of Israel Zangwill. Uh, the play was called The Melting Pot. It was enormously popular at the time. Um, and that that really that brought it into into the common lexicon, but the concept itself really goes back to the to the beginning of the United States, and we lose sight of that sometimes. That even our founders were drawing principles from from other parts of the world. Uh, Con- Confucian ideas found their way in the Iroquois Confederacy. Ideas from that found their way into our Constitution. John Adams visited the Basque country. And, and drew ideas from that to justify our our, um, our constitution. So, so it really goes back, uh, really, to the beginning of the United States as a, as a nation. Mm. Okay, and then the idea of multiculturalism. Where does that come from, and how has that evolved in recent American history? So multiculturalism really took off in the 1970s. There's a speech Jimmy Carter gave where, where he talked about, about our country being a mosaic and st- instead of a melting pot. And I have in my book an, an engram graph of the, of the term multiculturalism, and it was basically not used until the 1970s. And, and it really took off from, from there, uh, had a meteoric rise um, through the 80s and 90s. And it found its origin really from um, in, in anthropology schools in the 1950s and 1960s, and then in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it kind of spread to the rest of the rest of the culture. And I mean, the the crux of the difference there is that whereas the melting pot idea is that each ingredient blends into, is influenced, and influences 
the pot. Exactly. Whereas, you know, in a mosaic or a, a multicultural um, element, it's more like, I mean, people have used the term salad bowl sort of a, as an analogy to, which may be slightly different, but the ingredients don't mix. They don't become one necessarily. They exist side by side as distinct cultures, distinct peoples. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the multicultural idea is that you, you maintain ethnic boundaries and you recognize group identities and, and keep those group identities rather than focusing on, on people's uh, individual traits and, and treating people as, a, as an individual. So let's talk about the idea of assimilation. Assimilation, for some people, it is the goal of a multi-ethnic society. For other people, it is a dirty word, even a racist word. Yes. Right. So how do you view assimilation as a, as, as a goal in the context of a country like America or a, any European nation now that there is more immigration to European countries? Should assimilation be something that policymakers are striving towards or should they view it as you know a dirty concept to be avoided yeah so notably ibram x kendi i think compared assimilation to to genocide and assimilation in this country has in the last few decades been given a bad rap the uh, it's there's really been been a straw man erected around it. This notion that assimilation means that people who come here have to give up uh, their their heritages from wherever they came from, and that is not what the melting pot is about. The, the melting pot is is really a two way assimilation. Immigrate immigrants come to the United States and they adapt to the U.S., but the U.S. adapts to them too, and I, I think we lose sight of of how much different strands of, of immigrant culture have been woven into our own culture. And uh, we are not an Anglo-Saxon country. We haven't been for a very, very long time because uh, contributions of, of African-Americans, of, of Asians, people from all around the world, you'd be surprised how much they've been, they've been integrated into the United States. Mm -hmm. So I just literally a few days ago had Garrett Jones on my podcast. Garrett Jones is an economist who wrote a book called The Culture Transplant. And in that book, he argues that assimilation doesn't work that well. Uh, and the line of evidence he draws on is that when you compare, so for example, say you're just looking at white Americans and you ask them, where's their heritage in Europe? white Americans with Italian heritage, and then you compare their attitudes on all kinds of questions to modern Italians in Italy, you will find a fair degree of correlation between Italian Americans and Italians, Swedish Americans and Swedes, so forth. So he takes that line of evidence and says, you know, even down to the second, third, fourth generation, you find culture is sticky, right? So I've been chewing on that argument for a few days and looking at the evidence he presents for it. And I, I draw a very different lesson from that evidence. So for example, he points out that savings rates are correlated between uh, you know, second, third generation immigrants and their home countries. Um, he points out that... Um, I think trust in strangers is another uh, mm -hmm. another thing that is correlated. But then there are these other things that adapt to the new country very quickly. So for example, language. Um, I don't speak Spanish, despite the fact that half my heritage is Puerto Rican. And, uh, and that's very normal, right? R rarely do the grand, does the grandchild of an Im immigrant speak the home language. Um, measures like trust in police seem to adapt completely to the new country as opposed to the old country. Religion seems to be lost very quickly. It does it seems not to persist, which is uh, surprising because you would think religion would be the stickiest. Yes. Over generations, right? 
So when I look at the totality of this, I see a few measures where culture seems to be sticky over time and an an equal number of measures, perhaps more, where full assimilation tends to happen naturally, at least in the American context, without coercion. Um, And taken together, this looks like a story where assimilation is hardly perfect, but works pretty well. What is your view on how well assimilation works um, in the case of immigrants to, let's say, the West broadly? So I haven't been able to look at his data, mm-hmm. but I would guess that that his sample, um, again, without having looked at it, is probably skewed. Because if you're looking at Italian Americans today, who, who's an Italian American? Well, think about it. We'll take German Americans. In the year 1900, only 2% of German Americans intermarried. You go fast forward to 1990, 90% of Germans have intermarried with other groups. Uh, You go to other groups, uh, uh, Latin Americans, for example, it's around 39% intermarriage rate, Asians, 46%. So if I don't know how you identify an Italian. Uh, because if they've been here for very long, it's likely that they've intermarried. Uh, so if you're if you're surveying pure Italian immigrants, that's a, that's a skewed sample because most European immigrants um, tend to intermarry pretty quickly. I think to be clear, I think how his method worked was that he's just asking white Americans, "What is your what do you believe your heritage is?" Okay. Um, so and. The idea is that answer has some level of correlation with the truth. And I think that he'd be self-selecting a group that, that by, by the nature of that question would be less integrated than, mm-hmm. than the average American. Mm-hmm. And again, when I tell you, you know, I think the number is pretty close. Uh, 90% of Germ- German Americans intermarrying. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if you found somebody who truly identified themselves as German, you're likely to get a very different answer mm-hmm. than, than the you know, the many, many uh, people who are a quarter German, a third German, a fourth German. Uh, so it, I, I suspect that that sample would be skewed. Again, I haven't looked at the data, so, so I right. have to review that. So, so that's first off. Uh, and I, I think when you look at the United States, how, how we've gone, at least with white Americans for, for most of our history, the, the level of integration and assimilation has, has been very good. And you ask people, do they perceive of themselves as Italian or Irish or, or, or German, or do they identify themselves as American? And almost every, every European immigrant who's been here for more than a generation simply identifies themselves as American. Uh, mm-hmm. My father is a good example of that. He identified him, himself as an American within um, within a few couple years of arriving here. It, does that goal become harder when you have groups that look very identifi- identifiably different in a durable way? So when you have obviously Europeans from each nation do have a particular look, which has allowed in the past different groups to be discriminated against such as the Irish when they came to New York were, were um, horribly discriminated against and were at the lowest end of the totem pole with black Americans. However, over time, because Europeans do share broadly a kind of a, a look and a skin color, that, you know, one could worry that that makes it easier to um, blend and assimilate over time, whereas when you have groups that look that have a, 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 a color line, um, does that make discrimination easier over the long term? And so, for example, one one example of this is you go back to Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass expected that by now there would be no such thing as black Americans and white Americans, that we would have blended into a kind of happy medium brown skin tone, right? Yeah. Through intermarriage. Obviously that hasn't happened or it it has happened to some extent. There's a lot of mixed race people. There's like, you know, most, I think African-Americans on average have like 16 or so percent European genetics. 
and lots of white Americans have a little bit of African genetic genetics in them. But by and large, there still are identifiable, socially real categories, let's say, of white and black that people feel strongly about and can identify in most cases based on look. So how does the goal of assimilation change in the context of having really identifiably different looking groups? Yeah, it obviously makes it much, much more difficult because just as you say, uh, most European in immigrants uh, by mere appearance are not distinguishable anymore. Uh, when you have people who palpably look different, it, it obviously makes it a great deal more difficult. And intermarriage will, will help that. Uh, current intermarriage rate with uh, Black Americans and white Americans about 19%. Uh, it's really almost the lowest of, of, of any single group. Mm -hmm. um, now, you could go to Hawaii where, where you have a mix of a lot of different groups. And, and there you can see what maybe the future of America looks like, where there's really almost a minority of people who are lighter skinned. And, mm -hmm. and, and then people of, of various islanders, some, some Africans, some, some uh, Filipinos, and so on, that, that have become more, more and more indistinguishable and, and really almost a, a single group. Mm. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's the future that, that I hope we get to in the United States with uh, where, where there's so many different shades of, of, of black and white that it really becomes senseless to, to even draw a dividing line anymore. Mm. So in your book, you take examples from the ancient world uh, to and filter them through these concepts of multiculturalism and and uh, and melting pot. So, can we go through some of those examples real quick? Yeah. Uh, so, starting early on, uh, the Roman Empire was yeah. uh, most most notable example of of a real melting pot. And a, a lot of people don't have lost sight of this. It it wasn't starting with the empire. It started much earlier than that. The, the, what we think of uh, as a homogenous uh, group of uh, or homogenous Romans was actually Volscians and Sabines and Latins and, and, and half a dozen other groups, even in the early days of the Republic, it, it was already this syncretic mix of lots of different groups. And that was, that was really the, the model that Rome started with and, and it followed for a thousand years. So you get up into the early imperial days and there are lots of other groups being drawn into Rome, uh, you know, Gauls and Pannonians and Britons and so on. And Rome had this concept, just like we do in the United States today, that anybody could come and be a Roman. And it, in, in many cases, in, in skin color, by the way, didn't really matter either. I, I give several examples in the book of, of people who came from Africa who rose up the ranks in the Roman military, went, uh, became consuls, which is the equivalent of being like a, a president or a prime minister. Mm -hmm. And their, their skin color was really irrelevant in, in their rise up, up the ladder. Uh, so, so Rome was extremely successful with that, and it's one of the thing that one of the things that made it so resilient compared to, say, Athens and Sparta, which uh, had a very, very narrowly defined sense of citizenship, mm -hmm. and and people could call your citizenship into question very easily if you couldn't trace your ancestry back, mm -hmm. you know, a dozen generations. We have lots of examples of, of Persians and Africans and so on who, who became Rome, Roman uh, very, very quickly. So what did you have to do to become Roman? Was it a matter of speaking Latin? So that, that helped. A, a common way for, for people in the provinces to become Roman was they, they would join the military. They first as an auxiliary. And if they had exemplary service, they might, uh, might be granted Roman citizenship. Uh, right away. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes it, they didn't get it until they were retired. And there was a, a, a gradual expansion of, of Roman citizenship over, over the decades. So by the time you get to Caracalla, um, he was granting citizenship to pretty much everybody in all the provinces. Uh, so if you were, lived in one of those Roman provinces, you automatically became Roman. Mm -hmm. And so and that worked fabulously well for them because they had all these people, uh, different skin colors, different origins, who identified themselves as Rome, Roman, and they were willing to give their lives for it. 
Mm-hmm. Now, uh, you know, don't get me wrong that uh, Rome did a lot of bad stuff, right? They had gladiatorial games, they persecuted Christians, they persecuted Jews, but but they got this one thing, this melting pot idea so right that it, it really helped sustain their empire, especially in, in the later stages uh, when the old Roman families had faded out, there were all these people who, who were either born barbarians or they were born in the provinces, yet they saw themselves as being Roman and they, they would fight and die for Rome. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a weird paradox with these empires where, you know, they, they spread generally by conquests and by military expansion um, though, you know, there's, there's also often a missionary aspect and, you know, a, a voluntary conversion aspect, but at bottom they spread by conquests and are often bitterly resisted by people that later come to identify with them strongly and speak the language and so forth. But often, you know, in, in most cases of empires that have lasted a certainly the ones that have lasted a long time because they've been unified, that unification came at the price of what today would be considered, you know, basically war crimes. Um, if not certainly wars of aggression, unjustified wars of aggression from the perspective of the modern observer. But once those, those, uh, you know, those, those conquests were consummated, you end up in many cases getting um, an empire that lasts a long time and is stable and actually in the long run tamps down on what inevitably would have been warring states, right? You see, you know, in China and Japan, they have these horrible warring states periods where it's just, there's no unification of power. And then inevitably someone comes, conquers the entire region and ushers in a period of relative stability and peace. So there's this just this strange paradox that empires which spread by the sword and impose one vision and one culture on a region end up ushering in a period of, of stability by means that we would, that modern observers would, would view as totally unethical. Right. And, and so it's, 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 it's hard to know what to, what to make, what lesson to draw from that as, as modern people where like, um, you know, empire is no longer a valid concept. Absolutely. Um, for, I, uh, for justifiable reasons. You know, I would say even in the case of Rome, interestingly enough, I give some examples that, that there, there were multiple provinces, uh, notably Bithynia and Mauritania, that, that Rome acquired because their, their rulers, when, when they died, they basically bequeathed those areas to, to Rome because they said the best thing I could do for my people is make them Roman citizens. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so there were actually territories that are, were acquired not by conquest. And we can talk a little bit about Islam, but we see the same thing in Islam, that the, um, the amount of territory that was actually acquired by, by the sword has been overstated. And, and both Rome and, and, and the early Islamic uh, empire or uh, early Islam really contrast with, with say, the, the Mongols or the Persians or the Hittites who, who did precisely, as you said, they, they, they conquered vast areas and, and then maybe after that tried to impart some sort of shared identity. Mm-hmm. Um, Rome and, and the early Islamic state, uh, to a large degree, went, uh, went with, with a fair number of peace, peaceful acquisitions. And I, I do talk about this in the book, how when you look back at the early Islamic expansion, you would expect to see evidence of churches being burned down, battles, all that kind of stuff. And there's surprisingly little. And when we go back and we look at the, the Christian sources of the era, uh, uh, one, for example, says that, that the early Islamic uh, state was one not with, with conquest or battle, but in what he called a menial fashion. 
And a lot of a lot of people voluntarily voluntarily joined because it was such a co compelling proposition. So I don't deny that you know in, in both cases there was there was some violent conquest, but but a, a, quite a lot less than most people think. And it's because that that paradigm of allowing people to join the enterprise and and identify with it and become part of it um, that was that was just a really compelling proposition. Mm. So I'm a little bit skeptical of that. I mean, my feeling is that I, I, I won't pretend to be an expert on, on um, early Islamic conquest, but I'm, my understanding is there was quite a bit of resistance, definitely from the Berbers and um, obviously from Spain. And then it was stopped at Southern France, even in the cases that may, may look voluntary to what extent is that just literally an army coming into your town that you know you cannot resist right and so you don't even try you you submit and then your and then your children as as children tend to do grow up under a new reality where they now identify with it yeah there there is no question that that happens it's not a matter of simple like oh oh the, you know the story about muhammad is super interesting and the fact that you have an army that could vanquish me is totally irrelevant to my conversion, right? Yes, the, uh, uh, there's no question it, it, yeah. it happened that way a lot. But I, I'd know, for example, in the Berbers, uh, that yes, there were, there was resistance there. But you know who went? Who was the main force who went into Spain? It was Berbers. They had already right. joined the enterprise by right. that point. Right. Uh, so the the way I would describe it's it, not it, quite by choice though. It's uh, yeah, choice I, uh, backed uh, by. And, uh, you know, we credit, don't know a hundred percent, you know, yeah. um, especially in the first Islamic century, uh, our Islamic sources are, are really sparse. I, mm -hmm. Most of the history of Islam wasn't written until, until four or five generations after the start. Uh, so, so a lot of that's just speculation. Um, you know, the way I describe it is, is when I look at early Islam, I look at Rome, uh, it's, 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 Kind of, if if I were describing how to how to box well, I I use Mike Tyson as an example. You know, mm -hmm. throw a left uppercut like this, a right jab like that. I would not say you should bite people's ears off, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so so yes, Islam and Rome bit some ears off, but they did have this one thing that 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 made their enterprise work uh, very well. So so. We have to be really careful about that. I'm not endorsing their overall approach. I'm just saying that this particular aspect of what they did was very effective. And, and in some ways, how they got to that point, I, I'm not sure is, is quite as relevant as the fact that once they were there, they did this very different thing that, that, that other empires failed to do, notably the Aztecs. They didn't mm -hmm. do this and, and their empire was a disaster. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Cortez came in with three, 400 guys and was able to crush the place mm -hmm. uh, quite easily because it was such a disaster. And, and there was a lot more suffering in, in the Aztec Empire than there was for Rome. I mean, we have famously the Pax Romana, long period of history when people all around the Ecuban were, were enjoying very high living standards, even, even you know, relatively poor people. Mm -hmm. And that was all made possible by this notion that, that people from whatever their origins could become, become, become Romans mm -hmm. and, and share in that enterprise and, and whatever their skin color, whatever their origins, they could rise up the ranks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So Let's talk about some some of these other examples. You you talk about the example of Sri Lanka. Describe a little bit what why you use that example um, and what the history there is with regard to multiculturalism. Yeah, so uh, Sri Lanka is a, is a really interesting example because we have uh, two principal groups in in Sri Lanka who've been there for a very long time. Uh, the Sri Lankan Tamils and, and the Sinhalese. Uh, Sinhalese are primarily Buddhist and they speak the Sinhala language. Tamils are primarily Hindu and, and, and speak Tamil. Um, they've been there for hundreds. Both groups originally came there a very, very long time ago. Uh, most people would argue the Sinhalese were there slightly earlier, but we're talking, you know, thousand plus years ago. So 
these groups, for the most part, got along pretty well. Um, and we have accounts going all the way back to the Arab traveler, Ibn Battuta, who talked about how there was a lot of comity and understanding between, between all, all the groups in, in Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka had uh, several colonial periods, Portuguese, the Dutch, and eventually the British. And ethnic relations continued under all those, those occupations uh, really amicably. They got, a, got along quite well. Uh, all the way up until they got independence from from England in, in 1948. And a politician who was uh, really an opportunist, uh, SWRD Bender Nyaika, decided that he could get ahead uh, by addressing the economic dis- and educational disparities between the two different groups. Uh, he was he was Sinhalese. So he thought that to really launch his political career, he could appeal and kind of foster a sense of grievance on the part of the Sinhalese that they're just not doing as well as the Tamils. Uh, So he started out with um, what was called the Sinhala Only Act, where he basically uh, said Sinhala, his language would become the main language for, for the whole island. And that had the effect of, of putting lots of Tamils out of, out of government jobs, mm-hmm. out of uh, university posts and so on, because they, they couldn't speak Sinhala. It was effectively, a, it was a de facto affirmative action program for the Sinhalese. Mm-hmm. Now, why was there a disparity in the first place between Tamils and Sinhalese? Well, it was really happenstance. The uh, Tamils mostly lived on the northern part of the island and they, they got, many of them were educated by uh, American missionaries. So they got better education, especially in, in sciences and medicine. So even though they're a, by far a minority, you know, we're talking 15% or so of the total population, they, in many cases, occupied more than half the jobs in engineering and medicine. Mm-hmm. And that's, so there was a disparity. Mm-hmm. And, and Bandar Nyaik had decided that he could foster some grievances and, and develop a political following by exploiting that. Uh, so beginning with that measure, um, these two groups more and more decided, came to see that their, their interests were at odds. And there are lots of sociological experiments that show this, you know, when you, when you start identifying people as, as different groups and giving them different sets of privileges, um, animosity is, is the next thing that happens. It's, it's inevitable. Uh, so, the, so going into the 1950s, a number of pogroms started, um, riots, um, most of them, or Tamils, uh, or, or uh, Sinhalese targeting Tamils. And it really launched what was an on-again, on off-again civil war that, that really lasted all the way up into, until 2009. Now, Bandar Nyaika's wife, after he was assassinated, uh, decided to kind of double down on his policies and, and institute an official program of affirmative action, uh, benefiting the Tamils. So Sinhalese, uh, I, I'm sorry, benefiting the Sinhalese. Uh, so Tamils who, who again, got a majority of the medical and engineering degrees were reduced to a very small number, yeah. uh, which, which caused huge unrest among them. And it didn't, it didn't make the, the Sinhalese feel any better about the Tamils yeah. because a lot of the riots were, were Sinhalese attacking Tamils and not mm-hmm. the other way around. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's really how... The, that started, and uh, the incredible part of the story is that is that these groups got along very well. If you, if you look at uh, what the British bureaucrats were saying at the time of independence, they said this this country is the best bet in Asia. It's going to do better than Korea. It's going to do better than Singapore. And you fast forward to t- today, and it's it's a basket case. Uh, they have like one eighth of the per capita GDP of Korea. Or, or, or Singapore, mm-hmm. uh, this a country with a wonderful fertile land, uh, some of the smartest, most educated people in, in Asia. Um, it had everything in its favor. Uh, mm-hmm. They were uh, one of the most democratic and, and least corrupt governments in Asia. Mm-hmm. It all went downhill and it all began with that decision that we're going to distinguish between these Groups and we're we're going to try through government fiat to address that disparity. Singapore is an interesting example. 
now that you mention it, because they s- sort of famously have a essentially a quota system, but in only in really housing, where they have a a program to prevent ethnic enclaves. They make sure every building is you know part Malay, part Chinese, etc., so that you don't get you know, whole buildings of one ethnicity and people only growing up seeing people that are in their tribe. But they have that married to an otherwise fairly race neutral and meritocratic system of hiring and and education and so forth. So in some way, they recognize ethnicity in this special area of housing, but they don't have anything like race-based affirmative action or ethnic affirmative action of the style you described in uh, Sri Lanka. So that's my understanding. Um, what do you make of the Singaporean model? Yeah, so so Lee Kuan Yew, interestingly enough, visited Sri Lanka many, many times. And and he he helped shape a lot of, of Singapore's own policies based on what he saw there. He was horrified. And one of the last interviews he did with the New York Times, he talked about that. He said, if we had gone down the route that Sri Lanka did, uh, we would have been a disaster too. Mm. So if you go there, uh, you'll find, uh, yes, as you said, uh, there, there's a lot of government housing there. And what they do do is, is they don't want a building to be entirely Malay or entirely Chinese or so on. Uh, on the other hand, they, they do a lot of work to foster a sense of, of national unity. They have all kinds of songs, one nation, one people. And there's, there's a relentless focus on, on, on the shared Singaporean identity. So, um, the example you give is, is kind of an exception to the overall approach. Like you said, they don't have race uh, or group based affirmative action. And I would contrast that with neighboring Malaysia that has had such a program for, for, you know, 50, actually longer than we have, 50, 60 years. And you look at, if you ask any ethnic Malay living in Malaysia, would you be better off in Malaysia or in Singapore? They'd be much better off in Singapore. Mm-hmm. And that's the, that's the interesting pattern we see with these race-based affirmative action programs around the world is that they don't just make one group worse off. They make everybody worse off. Uh, and, you know, Singapore and Malaysia is one example. You go to Thailand, too. There's, there's a, a Chinese minority in, in Thailand that are more, that are generally better educated and better, uh, better off financially than the ethnic ties. Yet there's no program to, to correct that disparity. As a result, relations between uh, ethnic Chinese and ethnic ties are very, very good in that country. Uh, I, I interviewed groups of students in both Malaysia and, and Thailand, and it was it was fascinating to see the distinction there about how how well integrated the Chinese and Thais are in Thailand, and how poorly integrated they are in Malaysia, and, and this lingering sense of of hostility between the groups. It's 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 really troubling. Okay, so your general your general v- viewpoint here is that preferential policies are you know bad for ethnic stability and tensions and national unity is is good so i want to give what seem to me possibly two counterexamples um i'm not sure these are really counterexamples but i want to get your your response cuz you you don't really have a chapter about either of these in your book one would be france which famously has a very colorblind system Um, similar to Botswana, which you talk about. And we'll get to Botswana. But in France, as in Botswana, you can't ask anyone what their race is. The government is not going to ask it to you on a forum. Even if you are a researcher trying to, say, study disparities between, you know, French Africans, um, Arab French uh, versus European French, you can't get that data, pretty much. Like, it's, it's... it's taken race neutrality, ethnic neutrality to an extreme where you can't even ask certain questions, can't get certain statistics based on 
and, and certainly can't discriminate based upon directly based upon these variables, based on the idea that this is how to foster French unity. And I remember that there was, uh, I, I can't remember which World Cup it was, but much of the French soccer team uh, are people that are of African yeah. heritage. And French people will say, no, no, those aren't African French. Those are just French. Those are French citizens, right? Fully. And some people will see this as a kind of practiced blindness to the reality and others see it as no this is this is our attempt to forge a french national identity we do not want to participate in the segmentation of population that speaks the same language and shares uh shares has to share a nation together simply because you look different and your grandparents are from different places right so on the other hand, you know, we're speaking very shortly after F France had major riots along ethnic lines over a, a police officer shooting an Arab teenager. And without getting into the specifics of that, clearly French national colorblindness is not by itself sufficient to prevent tensions, right? So what do you make the, of the case of France? And I guess I, I, I will loop into this, you know, what, is there something you need over and above mere colorblindness in order to foster ethnic tension? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up that example because it, it, it perfectly illustrates part of the theme of my book. The problem with France, uh, the colorblindness is great, but their attitude towards integrating people is very different from ours. Uh, we are we are not an ethnically based nation. Uh, as I, I was saying before, immigrants come here, they adopt to the United States, but the United States adopts to them too. And you can look around our culture and you can see elements adopted from every corner of the world and they continue to be. It's, it's a culture in, in flux. The attitude of the French, by contrast, is not that you can come here and adopt ideas of, you know, liberté, égalité, fraternité, and so on. Uh, it is that you need to become ethnically French. It's this one-way assimilation that's often been attributed to the United States, which is wrong. Uh, so, for example, in France, you can't wear a hijab on the beach or, you know, a burkini. Uh, that's that would be unthinkable in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, you can you know you can wear a yarmulke, you can wear a hijab, you can wear whatever you like, and you can still be an American. Mm -hmm. The French notion is very different, and you can see that in their the restriction on on uh, language, for example, that you can't use English or foreign terms for this or that. And it's this insular protectiveness that they have about their culture that that I think really fosters the problem there. So it's okay, it's great to be colorblind, but at the same time, you have to, you have to make the assimilation a two-way process. Mm -hmm. and, and what they'd like it to be is a, a one-way process where, where every person, whatever their skin color, has to look and act and be French. Um, and that's, uh, Germany has the same problem. Uh, you have, um, now taking the example of soccer, uh, Mehmet Ozil is a great German soccer player. They, he says that he is only concerned, considered German when, when his team won, wins the World Cup, right? That's, um, and that's, it's very similar with the French uh, soccer players, that somehow they, they can kind of be French, but only if they win. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the main problem is, is they precisely don't have a melting pot model. It's, they have one way assimilation, which uh, historically has not worked. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and so another case, which I think could, could draw an interesting counterpoint, uh, is a case of India, which has, you know, they've had affirmative action policies longer than we do. And they use the, what, what in the West would be like totally impol incorrect, politically incorrect term backwards classes to describe the classes that underperform and therefore get group preferences um, and so forth, they have a rather extensive system of group preferences. And I just went on a, a podcast um, uh, hosted by a, an Indian podcast host, and he insisted to me, this is what 
has helped Indian society um, avoid far more ethnic uh, clashes than than <laughs> and, and tensions than we might otherwise have. He insists that affirmative action has been a success story there. Um, so do you know much about the example of India and how would you view that in terms of melting pot versus multiculturalism? Yeah, so I started a chapter in my book on India and then I read Tom Sowell's work on the subject mm -hmm. and I decided that there really wasn't anything I could add to what he said because he covered it so, so nicely and, and, and compellingly. The book you're talking about is Affirmative Action Around the World? Yeah, he wrote one earlier to 1992, uh, so it goes back a long way, it's called Preferential Policies. Oh, yeah. Uh, that one's out of print. And the Affirmative Action Around the World was, was almost, it was kind of a rewrite of, of the earlier book. Uh, so I, I decided that I really couldn't add more uh, to, to what he had said there. But I, I'd start off, first of all, and, and this applies to many affirmative action programs around the world. India's has been in place for 70 years. If it works so well, why the hell is it still needed? Right? Uh, 70 years, it hasn't worked. And, and the answer is, well, we need more of it, not less. And it, it, it's expanded to the point where, you know, 49% of people in India are uh, are eligible for one preference or another. And, you know, Seoul does a very nice job of showing how, how those preferences uh, bred riots and, and all kinds of, of uh, intergroup conflict over, over, over the years. And many, many riots that have been attributed directly to either instituting those affirmative action programs or, or reeling them back in. And this is a policy we see everywhere where they're implemented. Once you put these programs in place, they become an entitlement mm -hmm. that will be defended vociferously by the, by the beneficiaries. And there's another, uh, another phenomenon that occurs, and I talk about this a lot in the book, and, and others don't speak of this so much, and that is that the affirmative action beneficiaries in, in these countries, uh, because they want to defend the privileges that they enjoy, uh, they're naturally drawn into this thing where, where they tend to, uh, they need to justify those preferences. And one of the ways to justify it is, is by saying that the, that the group that the preferences are directed against is guilty of some sort of subterfuge. And, you know, we, we saw this in, in Rwanda. It was the case in Sri Lanka. It's a case in Malaysia right now. Uh, in order to maintain those preferences, the the, the beneficiaries uh, ten, tend to to promote all kinds of hatred and nasty stuff about the other group because it's you know it's how you justify it. Oh, those 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 Tamils they're acting in an underhanded way to maintain their privilege. Mm -hmm. Those those Tutsis they're behaving nefariously to be to maintain you know, their privilege. And that's why we have to have affirmative action to address that. So it's this kind of vicious circle where, where affirmative action promotes these conspiracy theories and, and this antagonism that's used to justify its existence. Mm. And, and we see that all the time in India. Let's talk about the, the cases of, of Botswana and Rwanda. Um, maybe you can sort of give a brief description of how you view those histories and compare them to each other. Yeah. So I'll start with uh, Rwanda and it's, it's a somewhat similar to, to Sri Lanka in, in, in the broad kind of trajectory of its history. Uh, two main groups in Rwanda, the Tutsis and the Hutus, and they actually got along fairly well up until up until the colonial era uh, that was co colonized first by Germans and then by Belgians. So those two groups, uh, it, there was a group distinction, but it was, it was porous. There was intermarriage between Hutus and Tutsis. A Hutu could become a Tutsi uh, mostly by acquiring cattle. A Tutsi who lost his cattle could become a Hutu. Uh, and so they, they, they did okay until the Belgians came in and like, Many colonialists, they decided, the Belgians decided they could do better with a kind of a divide and conquer approach. So based on some weird racial theories, they decided the Tutsis were the, were the 
the better group and that they would promote them. Uh, so they instituted a, essentially a program of affirmative action where they preferred the Tutsis uh, for government jobs, for higher education and so on. And, and just by, uh, by creating that distinction uh, immediately, they, they sowed this, this discord between the two groups. And whereas before the, the distinction was more or less porous, the Belgians literally issued what they called racial identity cards and said on them, you're a Hutu, you're a Tutsi. So that went on through the Belgian colonial period that they, they favored the Tutsis 30, 40 years up until the last couple of years, last few years of the Belgian colonial period, the Belgians flipped that system on its head and they started preferring the Hutus over the Tutsis. Yeah. Uh, so they demoted a lot of a lot of Tutsi chiefs and elevated a lot of Hutus. Uh, when the colonial period ended, 1964, the country gets independence. Hutus are, are the majority, so they take over. And they had an opportunity at that point to say, okay, we're going to put the past behind us. We're going to be, uh, I don't want to use the term colorblind because they're really not different colors, but we're going to choose a group blind policy going forward, bygones. Well, they, they didn't do that. They said, you know, it's, it's time to level the playing field. Never mind that at this point, the Tutsis on average are only making about 3% more income than, than the Hutus. Uh, so they, they pass a wide ranging program of essentially affirmative action to prefer, to prefer the Hutus. And that's where the trouble starts. Um, and just as in Sri Lanka, you have a series of pogroms and, and group conflict between the two, which culminated in the 94 genocide. And all along the way, as I was saying, when you institute these programs and the, and the beneficiaries have to justify them, how do you justify them? Well, you do that by demonizing the other group. Mm. And so the Tutsis were demonized and uh, kids in, in the schools in Rwanda, they had to stand up the first day of school and identify which group they belonged to. And then teachers would go on long rants about the Tutsi exploitation of the Hutus mm. and, and how the Hutus were slaves to the Tutsis. And that bred this division and contempt that, that just festered over the years and got worse and worse. Uh, so it was finally sparked uh, in 1994 and it just blew up because the, this hatred had, had become so intense. And how did it all start? It started by distinguishing those two groups. If the Belgians hadn't come there, if they hadn't distinguished between the two groups, my guess is it would be a happy, prosperous country to this day. Mm. So compare that to the case of, of Botswana, which took a very different route. Yes. Uh, so Botswana, um, and I encourage everyone to watch uh, the, the uh, film, A United Kingdom, just a wonderful film. It tells the story of, of um, the first uh, president of, of Botswana, a young man named uh, Soretsi Kama. Uh, so Soretsi Kama was actually destined to be king of Botswana. He was studying in England in 1948, uh, like, like a lot of future African leaders who were there at the time. And he fell in love with with a British woman, uh, and you know this is this is whatever 20, 30 years before. Guess who's coming to dinner? Mm. Uh, so you know you can imagine how insanely radical that was at the time and, and controversial. Uh, so the British government, along with Soretsi's own uncle, who's acting uh, acting regent of Botswana, did everything they could to prevent the marriage. Well, he got married anyhow. And it ended up with him being exiled from his own country, the country he was destined to be king of. Uh, and that, that went on uh, for quite a while. And finally, protests by the people of Botswana allowed him to return to the country. And if you fast forward to 1960s, he became eventually the first president of, of the new country of Botswana. And he took his lesson and his people took the lesson from his experience that dividing people by race uh, was a poisonous thing that would sow discord in their nation. So they decided from, from day one that Botswana would be colorblind. So, and I've visited Botswana, I've, I've 
talk to government officials on the phone many, many times. And over the years, I've tried to get uh, ethnic data from them about, you know, how many black people, how many white people. Mm-hmm. And they can't give you that information because the government has actually not recorded it since the last British census, which was in 1964. Uh, so nobody knows how many white people, black people, how many people of different tribes there are in Botswana. Mm-hmm. And how has that worked? Well, Botswana had the fastest economic growth for 25 years in, in the whole world. Today, it has better uh, corruption and health statistics in, in, in many areas than most European countries. Mm-hmm. It's it's not only one of the nicest places in Africa, it's frankly one of the nicer places to visit in the world. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so if we were to sort of download all of these lessons um, from the, you know, the case study of, you know, Botswana versus Rwanda, Singapore versus Malaysia, um, and, and, and so forth. I mean, how, how would the lessons that you draw from all of these cases, from the failures and the successes, what would they suggest about how current American culture and policy should change with regard to, for instance, K through 12 education about race, uh, uh, racial differences, attitudes towards American unity, and so forth? Yeah, so these case studies really prove the same thing that sociological studies on the subject have shown. Uh, going all the way back to the 1950s, where they've done studies, that the mere act of identifying people as members of different groups, um, a, a researcher by the name of Tajfel did a, did a number of experiments by the, around this, that merely, you know, a, a guy with a, a white jacket and a clipboard saying, you're group A and group B, uh, sows distrust between groups. It's a, the mere act of identifying people as different groups does that. And you add in, um, and again, the sociological experiments have, have demonstrated this, you add in uh, privileges or preferences that are, are granted on a group basis, that compounds the effect. And, and, and amazingly, in these social sociological experiments, and several of them ended in, in literal violence. Police had to come in and break groups up. And these are, these are groups created out of nothing just randomly selected. So you can imagine if you, if you divide people on the basis of some palpable difference that is, you know, you can easily discern like skin color, and, you know, dress or something like that. Uh, so, so these case studies merely affirm what the sociological studies uh, say, which is, is that the mere act of distinguishing people by group rather than by as individuals has a terrible invidious effect, and it inevitably makes everyone worse off, Uh, both the preferred group and the non-preferred group. It it makes everybody worse off. Mm. There's another line of research, which I remember from my episode with Yasha Monk, political scientist, which shows that the way you get people of different backgrounds to become friendly and overcome their whatever initial suspicion they may have is by having them somehow on a common project, working towards a common goal on equal footing. Paradigmatic example of that would be a military situation or say a sports team. If you get people of different, uh, you know, of different backgrounds, different races on a sports team, traveling together, trying to win together. By the end of that season, they will view each other as brothers and sisters, regardless of how they initially started. Yes. I I, I listened to that podcast. It was an excellent one. I love Yasha Monk. Uh, And I I totally agree. I think Amy Chua has talked about this as well, that, that, um, you know, one, one way to move forward perhaps could be a national service program, kind of like the CCC or, or alternative between military and national service where, where 
you bring people of different groups together and they work on a common project, like you said. Um, there was, uh, prior to its breakup, this was done in Yugoslavia. They, mm -hmm. they had something very much like that. A million people, it's not a very big country, Yugoslavia, a, a million young people got together and they worked uh, voluntarily. They worked on these, these road crews to build highways. And they had the slogan that we build the highways and the highways build us. Mm -hmm. uh, so Croats and, and, and Bosniaks and Serbs were all working together and, and really forming friendships. Mm -hmm. And the studies of that effort showed that it, it worked very well. Now, you know, a couple decades later, they took a wrong turn. They started, they instituted group divisions and affirmative actions and pretty much destroyed that effort. But for the time that it was implemented, that was tremendously successful. It really was, if you talk to older people from the Yugoslav Yugoslavia, they, they'll tell you, you know, what, how, that, that that was a golden era where they everybody was starting to see themselves as, as one united people. I mean, but what do you make of how fragile that can be, right? Because, you know, when 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 Tito dies and then the country just breaks and these ethnic entrepreneurs, similar to how you describe in, in, in Sri Lanka, opportunistic politicians can weaponize and reawaken a tribal identity that seemed to be melting away. Like, what do you make of the, the, the fragility of unity in the face of tribalism? Yeah, it, it's, it was definitely a problem there because they didn't have very long at, at it. Mm. Uh, those groups, as I talk about in the book, were already divided for centuries by the Ottoman Empire. Mm. They were separated into these different groups called millets. Yeah. Um, and uh, so Yugoslavia inherited that. So it only had about a decade of, of an effort to uh, what they call pan Yugoslavism. And then that was overruled. So, so it was particularly fragile in Yugoslavia, a country like the United States that has a heritage of, of uniting groups of, you know, a couple hundred years. I, you know, obviously minus, minus black and Hispanic people for the last few decades, but yeah. th that's been the overall policy. I, I don't think we're quite, quite as fragile as long as we steer away from the path of dividing people. Interesting you mentioned the Ottoman Empire because that's often talked about as an example of um, peaceful coexistence between, um, you know, uh, between Muslims and Jews and Christians and so forth. Um, how do you view the the Ottoman Empire's approach to ethnic diversity? Yeah, the the Ottoman Empire is a really interesting one because it, it's it's a curious blend of of the multicultural and mel melting pot models. Mm -hmm. uh, so if 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 you look at people who converted to Islam uh, in the Ottoman Empire, they they did very well, depending you know, regardless of their background. Uh, so we have, just like the Roman emperors, you look at, at uh, the grand viziers uh, over, over the centuries in the Ottoman Empire, and they came from everywhere. There were, there's Italians and Hungarians and, and you know, people from every walk of life could become a grand vizier if, mm -hmm. if they converted to Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, you had the various non-Islamic groups and they were, they were, sort of cordoned off in the, these groups called millets. Mm -hmm. And those, those groups were given, they were granted a fair amount of tolerance to practice their religion and, and do their own thing. Uh, the problem was it was an unstable equilibrium with those groups so that they were all partitioned off. And, and I give lots of, lots of accounts going back centuries in the books of how there was this, this sort of lingering an animosity, but among the groups, but it, it never really played out because you had this big iron fist of the Ottoman Empire holding things together. Uh, so that went on for centuries, but like I said, it was an unstable equilibrium. And once that, once the strength of that central government started to fade, these groups started to go at each other and the Muslims against all of them, so that that to my knowledge, the Ottoman Empire was the single greatest incubator of genocides mm. in human history. Mm. It spawned five different genocides. Um, what were the others uh, other than the Armenian genocide? Uh, so yeah, we, uh, we have it. obviously the Armenian one. It, it, it spawned a, a, a Serbian one. Mm. Um, 
the really the current Bosnian one. Mm. I, I'm scratching my head for uh, um, for the others. A Greek one as well. I, uh, so that happened a little early on. There are so, hundreds of thousands of Greeks killed. Yeah, um, interesting. So yeah, so you your you would score the Ottoman Empire as as probably among the the worst examples of. Um, how to manage ethnic tensions. Yes. Ultimately. Uh, and like I said, I, I, they got one part of the formula right. They actually tolerated, uh, you know, in a, in a time when heterodox Christians and Jews were being horribly persecu- right. persecuted in Europe. Uh, they did they did fairly well in the Ottoman Empire. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so it worked to that extent in, insofar as there was tolerance. But the tolerance was great. The division of people into groups and maintaining those those boundaries between the groups was uh, it was a Damoclean sword for them and one that eventually had to fall. So, yeah, it worked, you know, a few hundred years, uh, but then it then it crashed horribly with, you know, ultimately I give numbers in the book, uh, you know, ultimately millions of people being killed, uh, millions more displaced uh, at, you know, in the early uh, 20, late 19th and early 20th centuries. Mm. Yes. Um, okay. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting survey of, of just global, the global scorecard on preferential policies and division as opposed to national unity. And I really recommend people go to your book for more detail on any of those, um, examples before I let you go, where can you direct my, my followers who want to encounter more of your writing more of your work? Well, <laughs> Encounter Books is is probably the best place. I, uh, my book's available on you know Amazon, Barnes & Noble, just about anywhere else you'd buy a book. But uh, yeah, if they want to go directly to Encounter, that's uh, Encounter Books. That's a great. You have a Twitter start. or a website or are you off yeah. the grid? Uh, I, I was mostly off the grid until recently. Uh, now I, I actually am on, on Twitter, so uh, you can follow me on there. It's just Jens Heike uh, there. All right. Thanks so much, Jens. Uh, Thank you, Coleman. It's been great. That's it for this episode of Conversations with Coleman, guys. As always, thanks for watching. And feel free to tell me what you think by reviewing the podcast, commenting on social media, or sending me an email. To check out my other social media platforms, click the cards you see on screen. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.